So I am Aurelie, the event team lead of the EAG local chapter, and I'm happy to advertise you some of our next event coming. So we're going to have a joint workshop on uncertainties in geosciences with the EAG local chapter of London, Netherlands, and Paris. Uh, it will be the 21st of October. And then we'll have an event about geothermal activities in the Paris area uh, going in mid-November. Then some event about data analysis in geosciences and then economy on renewables. So stay tuned and follow us to have uh, some uh, updates on our next event. So here is the agenda for tonight. So we're going to have a welcome and introduction from Anna Soles, our uh, president, very new president of the EAG local chapter. And uh, introduction from Fernando Villanueva. And then it will be the talk of Dr. Jérôme Masso. Uh, very thank you for uh, giving this talk tonight about AI and machine learning applied to geosciences. And we're going to have uh, question and answers uh, during and at the end. Uh, so I will leave the floor to Anna for the welcome. Anna? You? Ah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> now. Okay. Um, as a new president of the local chapter Paris, I give to all of you a nice, uh, a warm welcome back after these nice holidays. Uh, this year, EAG has been renovated with a new president and new leads and volunteers. And to make it possible, we have a general assembly on 30 June. So uh, here is, it was virtual. Because, uh, because of time. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, next uh, slide, it is possible. Okay, so we have a new board. Uh, we, have, uh, four, uh, we have a board of four members, uh, which is president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. Uh, me, Anna Soles, as a president, Nawal Fresh-Long, as a vice president, uh, Raba as a secretary, and Chiara Bonomi as a treasurer. And we have uh, four great teams, uh, members in the event lead uh, uh, team, communication uh, team, company relations team, and a student and university relations uh, team. So there we have uh, uh, as a lead, uh, Aureli Lege, uh, in the communication lead, uh, Chiara Bonomi, and company relationship, uh, Annalisa Campana and in a students and university relation uh, as a lead of Fernando Villanueva. And now we have an, a new operational member, Laura Mosca. Uh, we also can, you can find our roles and uh, our uh, teams in Pirdon. In the, the page we have there, it's, it's open to everybody. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Uh, and first, uh, uh, we want to give a warm welcome to our new members, Annalisa Campana as a company relations lead, and Laura Mosga as an operational member in company relationship and students and university uh, relations. Well, for for the, the for the new people attending this event, uh, I want to say like EAG is a non-profit professional association founded in 1961. It was created for professionals uh, that are in, who are involved with geoscience and engineering. Actually, EAG provides a global network of commercial and academic professionals with around 20,000 members. So we are a big community and we help each other and we, we, fall, we share uh, many, many uh, workshops, events, um, also mentoring. So. Uh, after our mission uh, is, uh, the uh, is to empower members in knowledge and experience a chain, as well offering mutual support in various, uh, in the different technical communities we have. Uh, we want to promote the development, innovation and application of your science and related engineering subjects. 
and to foster the communication, fellowship, and cooperation between within uh, the professionals and companies also. Okay, so uh, in the technical community, uh, uh, to to achieve uh, our objective, we have different technical communities. Um, uh, for example, we have basin petroleum system analysis, artificial intelligence, mineral exploration, geophysics, seismic acquisition, seismic interpretation, geochemistry, hydrogeo hydrogeology, and decarbonization and en energy transition. So uh, we 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 have we work in these different technical communities, and we we give a, a conference in in these uh, communities. And also we work in the personal development uh, in a way like to give some conference related of that and also like uh, giving mentoring. Mm -hmm. So uh, between June 2020 and June 20, 2021, uh, EAGLC EA, local chapter Paris uh, have given many events. This time was challenging these events were virtually but at the same time it makes uh, people from everywhere in the in the world can can be attending and we we have received many people from different parts uh, of the world so we are happy of that and uh, in it in, in during that time we have given events as a digital health CAC uh, on machine learning in collaboration with EFP students in the in the technical community of artificial intelligence, we have also another event uh, in the mentoring side, like uh, called talents and Compet competencies in the energy sector, in collaboration with local chartered Netherlands and um, DET. We also have uh, given an an uh, an. Um, E event in in case says seismic interpretation for from diffraction energy in the seismic interpretation community and uh, two we have two events uh, given in the decarbonization and energy transition deep geothermal energy production legal framework and project development workflow uh, with a case study in north north northern Alsace France and also carbon uh, capture uh, storage in uh, in the offset strategies uh, also we have given another in mineral exploration geophysics uh, recent evolution in the research of mineral resources in the seismic acquisition we we have given assessment of induced seismicity and natural risk by your physical methods and in the basin petroleum system analysis we have given the integration of your science and your physics uh, knowledge for a strategy stat stratigraphic trap characterization and also upstream oil and gas industry after COVID. So and we have another uh, more events and uh, we have uh, next one we have uh, good feedbacks for uh, for our our um, followers and as, as we can see uh, all these events and as I said uh, we were it, it, they were uh, virtual as this one and um, but uh, we are happy to have this good uh, feedback and uh, also we we want to say thank you to our speakers uh, for this time and uh, uh, we we also want uh, to have this uh, good development uh, during this uh, this uh, this uh, this time like now i am the new president and we are very like looking for new volunteers so just contact us and if you want to help us in our in our teams uh, you are very welcome so don't don't uh, don't hesitate to contact us and um, yes and also uh, we uh, we we are we are uh, we, everybody who wants to be our partnership or sponsorship uh, everybody is welcome you just need to contact us with uh, by mail or by LinkedIn, and uh, well, I I we are waiting for uh, for you. And then next, uh, so now I just uh, say goodbye to everybody and enjoy this event, and see you in the next one.
Thank you, Anna. Fernando, uh, I'll let you continue. Okay, yes. Um, just inform you that, that uh, this uh, webinar will be recorded. Um, and I want to introduce uh, Jerome, our talk, uh, our speaker today. Uh, can you follow to the put to his view? Yes. So Jerome, he did an engineer degree in um, in Nancy, the School of uh, Mind in Nancy, um, UNS uh, Nancy, and he also followed a PhD under the supervision of Jean Laurent Mallet, uh, where he also worked for a startup company that developed uh, GeoCAD software. Uh, he has been working uh, in total uh, for more or less uh, 10 years, and now uh, he is working in the R&D uh, center in Slumberger, um, working in um, most of the part machine learning and deep learning um, and natural language uh, domain. So please, uh, Jerome, um, can you continue the, can you start your talk? Yeah, okay. So uh, good evening, everyone. I will uh, share my screen. Um, I, uh, yes. So normally, tell me if you see it. Yes, it is working. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Jean. So thank you, Fernando. Thank you, everyone. So my talk tonight is um, is just to introduce um, how we can use uh, natural language processing and knowledge extraction in uh, geoscience uh, in general. Um, uh, and without using maybe the state of the art technology available today, uh, this uh, talk is fact is inherited from the free last year. I have spent uh, working um, with uh, Google and Total Energies about these subjects. So recently, I quit uh, Total Energies to join the Schlumberger. But for sure, uh, the, the information and the talk I will present you tonight uh, is directly derived from the reflection and the, and the experiments I have, I have run for Total Energies. So first quick introduction, uh, quick, um, uh, what uh, I am doing and where I am working now is very quick review. So I have joined the Software Technology Innovation Center of Schumberger one month ago. Uh, it's located uh, in California in Menlo Park, uh, very uh, close to the Stanford uh, uh, University. It's a quite a new center because it has been established uh, in uh, 2014. Uh, and um, the objective of this uh, group of uh, researchers is to evaluate um, uh, technology trends uh, coming from the Silicon Valley's companies and local universities in, in, in Silicon Valley in, and in the US in general. Uh, and in particular, um, we have a small group of people trying to experiment machine learning, deep learning, and natural language processing to see how this technology can help us uh, and our customers uh, to make the best profit with their energy uh, business. So this was for the uh, Schlumberger introduction. So today we will focus on uh, natural language processing. So um, you will, uh, I think you will learn some new uh, jargon, some new words. Uh, that I have summarized in this slide. So don't be afraid. I will try to be uh, very clear and I will try to explain that in plain English. Uh, but uh, these are the, the different topics we will, uh, uh, we will uh, review together uh, in less than one hour. So uh, a lot of things to, to cover. Uh, so it will be, I hope, an interesting journey. But if you want to shine in the next social event, in a cocktail, you, you can uh, now discuss, or I hope you will be able after this event to discuss about uh, the different transformer architecture that you are using to extract 
knowledge from your uh, geoscience uh, publication. So um, why uh, is the energy industry needs this kind of technology to extract knowledge uh, today? Uh, for example, if uh, I uh, recenter uh, the perimeter on the carbon capture, for example, or carbon capture and utilization and, and storage, which is a very important topic these days in uh, energy companies, uh, we see a real tsunami of articles and papers which uh, overload the capacity of the researcher in terms of time and I will say uh, brain capacity. Uh, for example, if I go to Science Direct website and I just enter carbon capture uh, and I ask the engine to retrieve all the articles and papers uh, covering these uh, subjects, I have a huge amount of documents and a huge amount of knowledge uh, which I need to review quickly to try to see what is going on on the uh, perimeter of these uh, techniques. Look at that. For example, in 2020, almost 40,000 papers uh, have been registered in Science Direct about carbon. Uh, uh, capture. 2021, it was uh, almost uh, 15,000, and I think it in increased. And 2022, it's all way, all, already 14 articles uh, in incoming. So you see that it's quasi impossible for human beings to uh, review all this amount of information. So to help us to, to do our bibliographical uh, exercise, we definitely need uh, to be uh, helped by the computer and specifically by artificial intelligent, intelligence and, and knowledge management uh, tools. Some people, they say, oh, but don't worry so much because Google search could help you to do anything. And it's not, it's, it's partially true that Google search is very good engine. Uh, for generic information, but also for a more specific ones. So for example, if you go to the Google search and you see what is carbon capture, it, Google is about to uh, send you back some very valuable information. So the first capacity Google has is to understand what you are looking for. And this question and answering uh, capacity is based on what we call natural language understanding, natural language processing, and knowledge management. So this capacity for Q&A is, is a very big advantage uh, coming from Google. You have also the possibility with Google search to rank the page return when you ask a question. So it's a capacity to rank a big corpus of document in an intelligent manner. You have the capacity also to find similar questions and similar answers. So Google search has a capacity to uh, compute and to, uh, to find a similarity between the question you ask and other questions other people, other, other, other people have asked before. You have the capacity of summarization, uh, which usually uh, occur on the small right uh, uh, widget. Uh, and this summarization is coming, for example, from here, uh, from Wikipedia. And you see that uh, the summarization coming from Wikipedia has been served in French, uh, even if you ask a question in, in, in English. So beyond summarization, you have also the capacity of translation. And finally, you have the capacity to produce enrich answer. For example, here it's corresponding to videos. So this is done uh, using knowledge graph, and it's uh, an example of how to enrich uh, text uh, questions with image or videos. So everything seems perfect, and it's true that for any questions regarding generic uh, knowledge, such, such as sport, uh, music, uh, media, uh, news, uh, Google search is today one of the most powerful tools uh, available for humankind. But if you look carefully, 
you realize that you ask a question about carbon capture. And uh, for example, the USCIA, the USGS uh, website is returning information about carbon sequestration, which is related, but is not exactly what you are asking for. Uh, there is a difference between the carbon sequestration and carbon capture. So you see that even if it looks not so bad, if you go in detail, the result is not precise enough. So Google search is not very precise to retrieve information about very specific industrial topics. Is because Google search is a good generic researcher, but is definitely not a subject matter expert uh, in carbon uh, sequestration. And it will be the same for uh, geoscience in general. So to illustrate my talk, I propose you this use case. So you are a young geoscientist and, uh, or even an old one, and you have to retrieve information from a document lake, which is con constituted with uh, thousands of PDF documents. The document lake is definitely a big data problem because you have the volume uh, of information uh, it's made of uh, several thousands of documents. You have the velocity of the information because each day some colleagues can drop in a share box uh, some new documents to be analyzed. You have the variety uh, because each document uh, corresponds to maybe a different kind of documents. You can have well reports, you can have daily well reports, you can have synth synthesis analysis, you, have, you can have petroleum basin analysis. So uh, the variety is here. And there is also the problem of veracity because you need to be able uh, to detect if there is uh, some flow or some bias in the document you need to analyze. So these four Vs, volume, velocity, variety, veracity, uh, defini de definitely define a big data challenge. So the first thing you need to do is to extract the content and to process the text. And it's not a small challenge. It's maybe the biggest problem uh, in this workflow is to extract correctly the information uh, uh, stored in these PDF uh, documents. After the content has been extracted, you need to understand the content and you need to help the computer to understand the content. And this text understanding, we will uh, use uh, techniques, uh, for example, what we call the name entity recognition and an NER, the dependency between the information uh, uh, found in these documents. And what we call also the entity linking, for example, is the capacity of the computer to disambiguate the words for example, if I tell you this well has been well drilled, the word well has two different meanings in the sentence. And uh, if you don't train a computer to disambiguate these two words, it will produce uh, confused uh, answers. And when all these steps have been done, now it's, a, it's possible to train a computer to do some topics classification, to train a computer to be able to answer questions that a human being can ask, and even to train a computer to make a summarization of the content uh, uh, stored in these thousands of PDF uh, documents. And this summarization is, could be done, for example, with uh, what we call NLG, which is natural language generation. So this is the use case we can work on tonight all together. So the first step is, how to uh, retrieve uh, documents in order to train a computer to understand geoscience content. So definitely in a company, you have the possibility to use private data. So coming from reports, uh, presentations, database. And this is uh, a very important source of, inf inform of information for people working in a company like uh, Total Energies or NG or Schlumberger. So you have uh, pros and cons. The pros uh, is a perfect fit for the industrial content. And uh, the documents you have in the uh, private data lake 
usually have a very high business value. And the quality uh, for the technical content usually is ensured. You have also sometimes the possibility to have access to a very standardized format for the documents. The cons is that usually these documents are not very uh, numerous. Uh, if I give you some, uh, if some scales, when I say it's a small volume, for training a, a computer to understand a language, you need several billions of words. It represents millions and millions of uh, web page, for example. Uh, a typical, uh, I will say, private data lake could contain thousands, hundreds of thousands, even sometimes millions of documents, but it's still a, a volume which is still a little bit small to uh, reach the perfect metrics for a language model uh, trained uh, in a very specific technical domain. The other problem is the confidentiality. Uh, a large majority of the documents you can find in a private data lake could not be shared, even sometimes could not be uh, stored in a cloud uh, host solution, for example. The third problem is a narrow vision, which can be also a bias. Uh, definitely, when you take a document uh, covering geoscience from, from a single source of information, you have to face bias in the way that uh, the geoscience has been studied or analyzed. And finally, uh, you have also the problem of standardization, because uh, even if we assume a standard... St yes? Questions? No? Okay, um, if uh, even we uh, assume a standardization has been uh, rich uh, in, in the real life, the documents are not standardized as much as it, it should be to, to ease or work. The second uh, source of information is a public data lake. So public data lake, it seems to be nice. We have reports, we have presentation, talks, etc. We have articles, but uh, the pros is that the, the volume is bigger uh, the nature of the document and the content are assumed to be rich and diverse. The m big issues with the public data is that usually they are locked. In fact, that if you go to Science Direct or Elsevier or any kind of uh, uh, content provider, you realize that uh, science is not free uh, today. You need to pay a tremendous amount of, of money to get access to, uh, to this content. So if you need to accumulate I would say thousands or even millions of articles from, from Science Direct. It could cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe more than that. So it's usually not possible uh, for a private person or even for a company to access the amount of data needed to, uh, to, to reach uh, this uh, volume of, of document. And you have also a problem of licensing. Uh, even if you can access this document, usually you have a very constraining license and uh, for example, the product uh, of the study you could do with these documents, sometimes you are not free to use it as, you, as, as the way you want. And finally, you have also the veracity problems. For example, you may know that today you have a big uh, repository of articles for free, which is called uh, archive.org. And in this archive.org website, any author can publish the paper they want but of course, there is no peer review or small peer review. So you have an issue of veracity. So me, this graph, yes? Uh, I, I guess we have two questions. Uh, I don't know if, yes. you want, if you want to answer now. Uh -huh. Oh, but yes, it's open discussion. So even if you okay, take great. the yeah. Okay, yes, so, so please, uh, Jenny, uh, Jenny Messiane, Messian, um, I guess um, I see you raise your hand. Oh, yes, hello. Okay. So yes, I, I have wrote my question in the chat, but it's about the nature of the model. You can use a uh, classification model, I mean, to, uh, to get documents you have. So uh, I think it's in private data, you use a more specialized um, model rather in public data, you use a more general uh, model. And so you have to adapt hyper parameters in order to get the good, uh, model and avoid overfitting uh, and uh, get bad documents or not enough documents, depending on the cases. 
Uh, it's true that, um, in fact, when you define your classification model, you need to answer a business uh, problem. So you need to uh, you need to uh, to define the different classes of document in order to solve uh, a user problem. So um, if you are coming from a private data lake where you have a very specific documents, uh, for example, uh, I was talking about uh, well well reports, uh, synthetic uh, synthesis, basin synthesis uh, uh, report, etc. And if you are a final user. They need the model to be able to classify these kind of uh, uh, of documents, but it's true that you need to define a classification model to uh, to handle these issues. And if you feed this classification model with data coming from public data and public data lake, where in fact these kind of reports are, have not been found in general, but you will have a problem. It's it's uh, the typical problem of training a model with a specific uh, corpus of document. And using this uh, train model on a, an over uh, corpus of document, which doesn't overlap, um, so uh, it's true that you need to adapt uh, your um, your uh, different categories of document uh, to answer first user problems, and after that to fit the data set you have in your hands to train the model. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for your answer. You had another question, Fernando? No, no, no I guess um, uh, okay. it was Yannick who was the okay. same question. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Um, uh, yes, Fernando, don't hesitate to ask a question because I, I have my screen in, in presentation mode, so I don't see the questions uh, in the chat. So don't uh, yes. hesitate to interrupt me. I, I will okay, interrupt so. you at the, at the right moment. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, so this is uh, the question first about uh, how to access uh, documents. And finally, also, you have a question about the format. Uh, do, you, do I need to uh, move all the documents in PDF format? Should I keep uh, uh, the native uh, format such as uh, PowerPoint, uh, Word, PDF, uh, et cetera, et cetera? So the format is important to uh, take into consideration. And how to host this huge amount of documents? Is it uh, worth to use a, a cloud uh, provider? Is it worth to use on-premise uh, storage capacity? So all these questions are the questions you need to ask yourself when you try to start uh, this kind of work. The next yeah. step, which is a uh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, we have another question, and it's related to what what you just talked actually. Um, yeah. So Henri, tell me, uh, he's asking, what is the experience of Total and Schlumberger about the, uh, what are the most demanding tools for semantic analysis? Uh, mm -hmm. So they, but, uh, he asks, uh, there is a quick uh, Q&A systems, building mm -hmm. chatbots, summarizing documents. Yeah. So for the, for the Schlumberger uh, side, I cannot answer because I just joined Schlumberger one month ago, so I, I don't have the full vision. For Total Energies, it was clear that the objective was to create an equivalent of a Google Assistant or Google Search dedicated to uh, to geoscience. Um, and it was successful because after the the two and a half, three years we spent in, uh, in with Google uh, Cloud in, in Sunnyvale, uh, we have created, uh, the team, the Gaia team has created a tool which called Gaia, Gaia Explorer, and it's a platform to analyze a corpus of documents you can directly upload to the to the to the platform, and automatically will extract all the information from text, from figure, from a table, and it will give you the capacity to ask a question in natural language, uh, in plain English, uh, like a Google search, and you will retrieve automatically the answer. Uh, extracting from this corpus. And this is uh, already in production uh, within Total Energies and, um, and more and more people are using them. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a very successful product. So um, the, the target uh, proposed by Total Energies Management when we arrived in, uh, in, in California in 2018 was to do a, a search engine dedicated to dedicated to geoscience. So it's definitely uh, one of the um, biggest objective of uh, energy companies uh, or in, in any kind of industrial uh, people working today is to be able to extract knowledge. So it's, so it's and to, and to organize knowledge 
uh, from this uh, huge uh, corpus of documents. For the other, for example, there is other uh, activities such as uh, chatbot summarization. Mm, chatbot is something which which could be helpful, but is seen is still seen as a gadget, you know, and people maybe they don't want to spend too much time on that. Summarization is definitely the holy grail is to is to be able to have the computer summarizing a huge corpus of document uh, in uh, two or three uh, uh, pages. But summarization is still very difficult to uh, to handle. We will see that in the rest of the of the talk. So summarization is a very final objective, but we are still uh, we have a long journey to do before to reach a good value, good valuable summarization. Okay, thank you, Jerome. There's one more question. I guess we can stop now, and so you can continue. the The last question will be: Is your your work uh, you did with Total Energy? Uh, do they apply it right now? Yes, it's in it's in production. Okay. It's in production. Uh, deploy in uh, Total Energies uh, for the Total Energies uh, geoscientist uh, in, in production. Okay, so we can stop the question for the moment, and we we'll let you continue yeah. there. Okay. Presentation. Um, so when after we have this uh, data lake, uh, the first thing to do is to extract the content and to process the text. So this seems to be a very uh, easy problem, but in fact is uh, very challenging. So we have two strategies. Uh, the first is to use native uh, PDF and to do a direct extraction. And usually you do that uh, with a uh, different tools available on the market and hopefully they are open source uh, solutions. So you have Tika, P PDF to text, uh, Growbid, and these are very good tools to extract the text from PDF. Uh, of course, this text extracted from PDF, you need to clean the text. It's not 100% perfect, but it is, it is much, much, much more efficient to, to use these tools than to do the traditional copy paste manually especially when you have thousands of millions of documents. Uh, to access uh, more information, especially the figures and tables content, what you need to do is to, is to use the image directly because extracting a figure and table from native PDF is very difficult because the PDF format has not been done to ease the process of extracting the, the information. So in order to do that in an efficient manner, what we do, we scan the, the PDF or we save the PDF uh, as images and we use these images and Vision AI to extract the text also with OCR, to extract the tables and to extract the figures. And this is a way to proceed. And uh, you, today using a, a pre-trained model or custom trained model, it's a very performant way to extract the information. Uh, once this information has been extracted, uh, especially for the text, uh, we need to uh, process this text uh, in order to uh, extract different representations uh, from the text. So representation is a very important notion in AI today. And if there is a single, uh, uh, a single I will say, uh, content uh, and single knowledge to, to, to keep from this uh, tonight talk is a concept of representation. A text uh, could, could have different meanings and could be represented in different ways. For example, if you take a text, a paragraph of text, you have a representation made by the word themselves individually. You have the representation made by the sentences and you have the representation made by the paragraph. It's the same, it, 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 these three representations are coming from the same, same content, but each of these representation content unit elementary knowledge, which are different. And when I say words, uh, it's also what we call n-gram. N-gram is in fact the combination of two, three, four, five different words following in the same sentence. So these representation are very difficult way and a very important way to represent information coming from test for a computer. And it's where we think, uh, it's where the, the, the difficult representation is very obvious for a human brain, but it's very difficult for a computer. 
So it's a reason why, in fact, even with the latest AI uh, uh, techniques, um, human brain is still ahead in terms of knowledge extraction is because whole brain has been trained to uh, use a different overlapping representation without thinking about that, where in fact, a computer needs to think about this different representation uh, in a not very automatic manner. So if I take representation uh, example on this slide, uh, for image content, usually it's not so difficult to imagine how a computer can uh, represent an image in memory. In fact, for a computer, an image is just uh, an array of, uh, of numbers corresponding to the, for example, to the grayscale uh, of each pixel. Uh, and uh, for a computer, it's very easy to represent an image in a numerical format. And all the AI tools uh, using image as an input data is using this kind of numerical array uh, representation. So this is quite straightforward. For a text, it's a little bit more complicated because people, they don't realize how to uh, represent a, a text as a numerical format. Well, in a sense, if you take the words themselves, it's not so difficult because you can represent a character mm, corresponding to the words. And if you affect to each character uh, an index, numerical index, you see that each character can be uh, described as a vector of index, each index corresponding to one character. And if you combine words together, but you combine the vector of uh, indexes together. And at the end of the day, you definitely have a, a matrix of uh, numerical values representing a text. Um, to be efficient, uh, computer scientists, they don't use directly this matrix of, uh, of numbers. They use what we call a contextual embeddings. It's a dense representation. It's a mathematical dense representation of the, of the text. Um, and I will show you an example of what we can do with that. And for a document, it's approximately the same. You have two different ways to represent documents. If you keep a document and if you consider a document as a collection of words, you can describe a document using, I will say, a frequent twist uh, uh, a frequent twist representation. So you just take the words or the engram, you count the occurrence of these words in a document, and you can represent a document as a frequentist representation of the word containing, uh, contained in these documents. You have also a way uh, to represent a document as a single vector, what we call also an embedding, in fact, and as it's exactly the same, um, the same idea is how to represent a document into a single, into a single condensed numerical vectors. And uh, it's possible today uh, to do such a mathematical transformation very efficiently and with uh, very interesting application. So just to summarize, it's possible for a computer to represent text in terms of uh, numerical vectors, even document. And you will see that everything I will discuss uh, about NLP and uh, knowledge management uh, in the rest of this presentation, everything is based on this numerical representation of text made by a computer. So here, normally, uh, I, need, I can switch maybe to a, a, a notebook. So when I switch, maybe it will be a good time if you have some uh, some uh, questions, Fernando. No yes. more questions. Does, does, does anybody have a, uh, a question? Okay. So if not, I can uh, I can share the first thing to illustrate. Okay. No, there is no more questions for the moment. Yes, now we see with your call notebook, John, so you can continue.
John, I guess we cannot hear you. So let's wait um, a minute so Jerome can handle his presentation, uh, his mic, mic, microphone too. Yeah, I think, I, okay. I don't know why, okay, I was mute. I don't know why, but I will try to redo it only. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. In fact, apparently when I share my screen, he mutes, he, he mutes me automatically. I don't know why. <laughs> yes. Alors, let me check. Uh, I do that. Okay, not a big deal. In fact, I cannot share if I if I share, it mutes me a lot. Let me check if I can do. Yeah, okay. If I share uh, the full screen, uh, you is not muting. So normally you should see on the left part the um, the code. Okay. Yes, we we do. Okay. So what I in this uh, notebook, what I ask the computer, I ask the computer to take a, a, a big uh, book. Uh, covering geology, to read the text, and to compute automatically the representation of each word that he will find in the text as a vector. And you can see uh, it's very quick. And if I ask, for example, the uh, model to give me the vector corresponding to the word migration, you see that for the computer, the word migration is represented by this big vector of numbers. Uh, it's 100 numbers because I ask, the, I ask the computer to automatically compute the representation of the words using an embedding space of 100 dimension. So for a computer, the, the word migration correspond to this 100 dimension vector. So you will see, and you, will, you, can, ask my, my, you can ask me, OK, it's an, what can I do with that? Because it's interesting for a computer. But me, as a human being, what can I do with that? But for example, when you have vectors now in an embedding space, the computer can compute similar vectors uh, in the embedding space. So if I ask the computer, give me the neighbors in the embedding space of this word migration. If you know, think not anymore in the text space, but in the embedding space, in the numerical uh, 100 dimension space, the computer automatically look at the vectors which are similar to the word migration. And you see that he found these words, fluid, just a position, pathway, migrate, communication, expel, maturity. Of course, you have some words which are difficult to match, like a lucky wood or, or poor. But you see, fluid, just a position, pathway, migration, expelled. You see that automatically, just by analyzing the similarity between the, these word vectors, the vector has found the computer has found words which, in a geoscience uh, point of view, are not stupid. All these terms of the majority of these words are related to the hydrocarbon migration, and this is done without any supervision. I didn't train, I didn't tell the computer how to do that, he has done that automatically. And another thing is to compute the analogy. For example, if I, told the, if I tell the computer, the sandstone 
is related to beach and I ask him to find the uh, same kind of relationship uh, for the word reef. And but you see, automatically, the computer knows that the reef is related to carbonates, platforms, coral, and this is mounts. So this is done automatically. Why is done automatically? It's because to compute this uh, numerical representation, in fact, the computer has analyzed the different occurrences of the world in the big text I gave him for training. And he has analyzed the context of these uh, world occurrences. And automatically from this context of the world occurrences, he has computed vectors representing the worlds and using these vectors, I can extract some information, for example, the neighborhood or corresponding more or less to the topic and the analogies. So if you look at the analogies, the computer mimic a knowledge about, I will say, uh, lithology or, or petrophysics or sedimentology. If you look at the computer, he knows that the reef are related to carbonates the same way that the beach or the, are related to sandstones. So this he mimics the knowledge and this, this um, kind of knowledge is direct, direct, directly related to a probabilistic computation, which has been done from a text corpus. Yeah, uh, just uh, one more question. And I guess it's yeah. related to, ju to ju just what, um, what ju just talked. Uh, so the question is, what are the, the features captured by every uh, word vector related mm -hmm. to migration in this case? What are the features? Alors, we don't know. In fact, this is the beauty of the, of the approach is that there is no given features that a human being has to, has to tell to the computer. I just give here, you see, I just give the number of features I want to use. And if, or for, for example, if I say I want a word representation based on two features or three features, the computer will create a word representation only based on three features. I, there is no human, in, in, there is no real meanings on these features. It's just a probabilistic representation. But if I ask the computer to use only three features, I will have a very poor, uh, uh, capture of the knowledge behind the words. If I use 1,000 features, the representation will be thinner, will be more precise. So maybe using 1,000 dimension, it will be able to capture what I could consider as a more geological knowledge. But once again, because uh, no geoscientist obliged the features to the computer, this knowledge, which seems to be visible uh, from this example, is just a fake knowledge. It's just a probabilistic similarity or probabilistic analogy, but it's, it's still very valuable. Yes, I guess it is uh, sometimes difficult to interpret those kind of uh, features, um, especially it's, when they are embedded. Alors, it's, it's not possible. You, you cannot represent, uh, you cannot understand the meaning of these features, especially when you have 100 or 1000 features. Um, this uh, unsupervised approach uh, has benefits because, for example, if you had to take all the words in a dictionary and to try to explain to a computer that migration could be related to fluids, could be related to pathway or, or uh, the expel, uh, expel oil, it will take a lifetime. It's not even possible to do it manually. So these contextual embeddings, it's a way to very quickly, because you, I can run, you know, for example, I will run on, on the fly the computation just using just using 10 dimension. And you will see that the computation is, so, is, 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 very, is very quick. So while, while the uh, code is running, can you please answer this question? There is one more. 
there's three more. Uh, okay. So one question will be oh, about. Oh, I, I can look at the chat at the same time. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's, um, yeah. So Jean-Jacques, Jean um, that's the following question. The next question. I don't mm -hmm. see, uh, I guess, uh, no, 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 no. Sometimes geoscience definition differ from one author to another one. So how is a computer able to integrate these together? Alors, in fact, the computer is not able to integrate these differences. If from the text I gave to the computer, there is only one definition, it will follow this definition. If in the, comp in the, in the text I gave to the computer for training these embeddings, you have the, the multiple definition of the same context, automatically, he will use the probability of the different occurrences in this context, and he will, he will create an embedding vectors, which will be the global average or the global, I will say, dominant representation of the definition. But because the computer is very stupid in a sense, and it cannot uh, understand what is reading, it's just a probability, probabilistic representation, he will not be able to uh, exactly uh, keep the both definition. The, the, the final vector will be a, will be a mix of, uh, of the different, uh, different uh, knowledge. Could, uh, can, the, uh, question. can the algorithm reproduce a complete text based on pattern you have training data? Alors, yes, but uh, we, we will show that in the next part. It's called text generation. It's related to the text embeddings, to the word embeddings, but it's not totally related, but we will see that in the, in the next. Alors, what are these dimensions is the internal representation of the vector. So for example, here, I say, give me, uh, I, I ask the computer to represent the, represent the words only by using a vector of 10 dimension. So you see the word migration now is represented by this vector, which has only 10 dimension. The dimension in fact is, gives, is a degree of freedom that you give to the computer to extract the knowledge uh, using a probabilistic approach. But if now I reproduce the neighbors of migration, ah, but it's, not, it's not so bad. You see, the, 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 the migration neighbors are still juxtaposition, connectivity, communication. So ceiling, so they are different, but they are not so bad. If I look at the analogies, ah, the analogies, it is a little bit more complex, you see. The analogy is green, there is no sense. Algae, yes, but no. Coral, yeah, definitely. Rudist, why not? But after that, it's not very good for a mini fair, but he was not able to find the same analogies as the, the, the last time. It's just because in terms of um, knowledge extraction, when you give 10 degrees of freedom to the computer, but he was not able to uh, be as smart as when you give 100 degree of freedom. So the dimension is just the capacity of the computer to memorize the context of the words in the big text document and to extract uh, some kind of information from this context. How do you capture the context around the token in case the document has complex layout? Yes, Alors, if we can, we can finish uh, yes, this, this last an question. And, yeah. <laughs> because if not, we will finish at midnight, but it's good for me, but it's good for you. Alors, the layout <laughs> is a very important uh, uh, thing. We will see that at the end of this presentation, there is a big challenge to extract text from a complex layout, such as a multicolon PDF, but there is tools to do that. But the idea is to move from the context layout and to reconstruct the text in a simple manner uh, as a very simple uh, text with a single column uh, to avoid the confusion uh, provide, uh, produced by this, uh, by this uh, complex layout. Alors, I will try to go to the, to come back to the presentation now. Okay, thank you, John. Alors, no problem. Alors, what I wanted to, to show you with these uh, examples is just to show you that in fact, um, a computer, understand the text uh, using probabilistic methodology. A computer doesn't understand a text. So normally, could you see my, my slides? Normally, yes. Yes. 
I guess so. Yes. Okay. So a computer doesn't understand a text a content. A computer mimic the text understanding using a probabilistic approach. So the probabilistic is is on, is is, uh, is conditional probabilistic. In fact, is what is the probability to have the word n at the position n in a sentence, knowing the n minus one previous words is no more than that. So, and all the beauty of the NLP and AI related to words and to text is based on conditional probability. So how do you, uh, how do you uh, explain the probability and the conditional probabilities of text occurrence to a computer? But before uh, deep learning and before uh, 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 10 years ago, the people uh, were linguist people. They use heuristic uh, grammar, rules, syntax. They use that and this, they code these grammar and rules in terms of computer programs. It was a very long and very boring process, but it was working fine. Um, but for the last couple of years, the people say, okay, rather than to code manually these rules, we will let the computer find by itself these rules. If we have enough text to feed into a computer, but using probabilistic uh, approach, it will find equivalent of the grammar rules and semantic rules by itself. And it is what is done. And in fact, today we have a mathematical engine, which is um, not very complex in terms of mathematics, but is very complex in terms of efficiency because the mathematics is very basic, is probability, is a, is conditional probability, probability. But what is complex is to have the mathematic scaling when you try to analyze billions and billions of text rather than ten text. If give if you give me ten sentences, I can create a language model with Excel or with a uh, with a Texas Instrument uh, computer. If you give me billions of text, you need to scale the mathematics and you need to scale the code to be able to uh, treat billions of documents. And all the new uh, and the, all the state-of-the-art model today are definitely uh, uh, dedicated to scaling uh, mathematics uh, to treat billions of documents. So this BERT character is coming from uh, uh, from uh, Sesam Street. It's also the name of a very, very famous NLP architecture uh, proposed by Google to uh, analyze a big amount of text. So you see, to come back to that, there is no mystery. It's not magic uh, science. It's not rocket science. It's conditional probability. Alors, the problem with the text understanding is that uh, companies like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they have proposed a big, huge model trained on quasi all the internet content. And it takes six months or even years to train this model. It costs millions of dollars. And it's possible to do because, as you have seen, it doesn't require supervision. You can just accumulate uh, billions of paragraphs of text. You can have a very big computer costing millions of dollars. And you can have this computer computing for months. And at the end of the day, you will have a very, very, what we call foundation model, a general knowledge model. And it's very performant. And it's the reason why now you have uh, people using uh, Google search or even other tools uh, using uh, plain English. And the computer can understand uh, what the people are, are saying or are writing because the computer has been trained uh, uh, on approximately the full internet content for several months. But if you want to use this kind of generic model to classify text, to extract very specific information, to do summarization, you cannot anymore work in an unsupervised mode. You need to, mo to work in a very supervised mode. Uh, 
And as soon as you enter the supervised learning process, it's where the problem occurs because you cannot provide to the computer the full content of the internet uh, in supervised mode because it will requ require too much work made by a human uh, to uh, provide this kind of training data set. So for general knowledge, these big language models are very good and because it's exactly fit for purpose. But now if you want to use this general model in a very specific domain, such as medical science, financial science or geoscience, you have a problem because this general domain language model uh, are not fit for purpose. So what the people are, are doing in fact, is that they adapt this general knowledge language model to specific knowledge domains. So they take this big model and they retrain this big model on a very, 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 very small corpus. But this corpus, there is this corpus are focusing on very specific medical or financial uh, domains. Uh, and if you do that, you can adapt, you can adapt the language model to work so-so on a medical stuff or on financial uh, uh, stuff. It's not perfect, but is much better than nothing. The main problem with geoscience or CCUS, for example, is that no such domain adaptation is possible because there is a lack of data and label data uh, to fine tune the generic uh, model to uh, or a domain of expertise. So if we don't provide the computer uh, label data uh, dedicated to geoscience, for example, to uh, classify geoscience uh, text, uh, to detect entities and name entities uh, regarding geoscience in text, if you don't provide this label data, it's not possible to fine tune this generic uh, language model. And the, basically, as you see on the screwdrivers uh, in the, uh, the Philips screwdriver uh, adapted to uh, the plate, uh, to, the, to the screw, is not working at all. So to do this fine tuning, what we need, we need label data for text classification. So geoscience label data for text classification. We need geoscience label data for topics modeling. We need geoscience label data for name entity recognition. And we need geoscience label data for summarization. So with that, the help of a subject matter expert, and as a geoscientist, we are subject matter expert, uh, the best Google model, the best BERT, could not be successful. So what we need, alors, how to not be successful. I will show you uh, an example to illustrate this problem. Um, and I go again and you will see it will be kind of funny stuff. If I share now my screen, Normally, you could see uh, another piece of code. Is it okay with you? Yes, it is working. Okay. There, so there you is see... a way to, to zoom in, um, John? Yes. Uh, I'm, yes. Um, yeah, that's better. Is better? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So I take the latest, one of the latest and more performant foundation model, which is called GPT-2. Uh, which is a general language model. And the purpose of this model is to predict, is to do some text generation, is uh, to answer the question of one of the, uh, of Maria. No, it's not, uh, no, it's, I don't know who asked the question, but is a computer about to, to do and to complete uh, text by itself. So I, I take this language model, which is a state of the art language model, and I ask him to generate uh, the, uh, to continue text. I say, okay, the first, the, the beginning of the sentence is the permeability of the reservoir. And I ask him to continue the text. And he says, the permeability of the reservoir is very important factor when it comes to maintain a healthy climate. So basically, it has no sense. I can redo it because it's, uh, it will not produce each time 
Alors, the permeability of the river water in comparison with other river system is well known. So it means that in terms of syntax, of syntax and grammar, the English is quite good, but the meaning is not good at all. It's meaningless. So for example, if I use the proven volume, the proven all volume is, alors is 1.25 billion barrel a day. Wow, not so bad. Um, so you see, again, the sentence is grammatically correct. So here we can see that the model has been trained correctly uh, to reproduce English by itself, but the meaning is totally stupid. So if I take another model, which is a little bit better and which has been trained on, on more uh, training data, it's a little bit longer uh, to infer a sentence, but usually the, the, the solution are a little bit more geological. The permeability of the reservoir rock to hydrogen gas, however, may be increased by the hydrogen containing fluids. Okay, so you see that it's a little bit better because the context has been focused on geoscience a little bit more, but it's still not good. If I say the all proven all model uh, is not greater than the oil produced in Iraq for the moment in the past year, blah, blah, blah. So it's a little bit better maybe because he has found that Iraq is an oil producing country, but the meaning of the sentence is not very good. And this model has been trained on 1.3 billion uh, text. So you see that if I go back to the slide, you see that uh, definitely there is a big room of improvement, uh, especially because you, it's illustrating the limitation of the generic model uh, to reproduce meaningful geoscience content. They reproduce good English, but totally meaning, meaningless in terms of geoscience. And why? It's just because this model has not been trained with geoscience corpus. So now, how to use AI in geoscience? We need to move from a model-centered approach to a data-centric approach. We need to retrain or to fine tune this big model with geoscience. So the first thing to do is to share all together an open source corpus of documents. And this is very challenging and is maybe where a, a, an association like AGE or, or other association could help uh, the companies or the people doing geoscience NLP is we need absolutely to find a way to put in, into a shared drive the, a huge amount of documents related to geoscience to give the geoscientist and to give the NLP practitioner a way to extract a huge amount of text covering geoscience activity. The second thing which is needed is to create what we call ontology. Uh, uh, ontology is just a way to organize the knowledge in concepts. So for example, if you uh, take the ontology related to carbon capture and storage, we have the concept of sink, where the carbon is stored. We have the concept of sources, where the, from where the carbon is generated. We have the concept of chemical, because as you know, in a carbon capture, it's a very chemical heavy industry. So these ontologies, are already existing for several of them, but we need to make sure that everyone is using the same ontology because when we provide to a computer an ontology, it's a way in his mind and in human mind to organize the knowledge into concepts. And finally, we can also use knowledge base this knowledge base could be database, it could be glossaries, it could be dictionaries, and these knowledge bases are used to label or to extract the information directly from the text document to do the labeling. So for example, if I take some dictionaries coming from a database or glossaries, I can directly write a computer a very easy code in Python, for example, to parse all the text that I got from my corpus and to find if there is some uh, overlapping or some mapping between these dictionaries and the text. And I can automatically label the text entities 
using this dictionary attack. I can use also regular expression. Regular expression is a way uh, to uh, tell the computer to find some very regular pattern in a text and to map a pattern to a category of uh, knowledge. For example, this single line in regular expression will give you the possibility to extract all the date information in a text. So uh, with a single regular expression, you can extract all the, all the text, all the date from a text. I did, for example, regular expression, and I used that to, uh, to extract all the numbers related to units. For example, I gave regular expression, and I gave the computer all the different units we can find in geoscience. Uh, uh, per, uh, petrophysical units, volume units, etc., etc. And just re using regular expression, it's possible to extract a lot of information directly. So when this information is extracted, but I can I, I can directly use that to answer questions. Uh, if some people ask uh, what is uh, the what uh, in, when this uh, uh, reservoir oil field. Uh, has been uh, produced for the first time, I can already uh, extract some dates from the text. Uh, it will be time information. The, the, the problem is that maybe the, the time I will come back, if I will give back to the user will not be the date of the first uh, oil of the field, but it's still possible to do that. So there is hope to, uh, to, to use this direct, direct extract, extraction uh, to serve information to the final customer. But this information is much more valuable when you use them to label automatically the data set to train deep learning and to train, for example, a BERT model. So in this example, it's corresponding to the test we have made when I was working at Total Energies. In fact, if I take only 3,000 sentences coming from a text corpus, and I use this approach, this regex and dictionary attack to label automatically these sentences. It corresponds to approximately 13,000 levels. And if I train a, a language model with only these 13,000 levels, I get some model which is able to recognize the concept of well, the concept of acquisition from the well, the concept of measurement, the concept of value, which can be a value of petrophysical property, for example. So I can train a language model which is able to extract geoscience uh, concept much better than if I was using a generic language. And this specific geoscience language model is only trained with 3,000 sentences. So it's not impossible mission for a geoscientist or for a company to do that. But to label efficiently this 3,000 sentence, we need to use automatic information extraction based on dictionary or regular expression. So when I have this corpus of documents and when I am able to automatically label this corpus of document, what are the beneficial, uh, what are the benefits? The first benefit is for topics classification. When you do topic classification, you can work in an unsupervised way. Uh, you just let the computer to find by himself the possible topics uh, covered by the text. And he use a matrix factorization approach uh, to do this uh, topics classification, topics modeling, in fact. He could give us some uh, information, but usually it's quite low value uh, because uh, mathematics, uh, even with a big amount of text, mathematics are not very well equ equipped uh, to uh, understand geoscience uh, topics. You can do topic classification, but in a supervised model, in supervised way. In this case, what you need to do is to provide to the computer a, a, a big list of text, and for each text you provide, you attach to that text a, a list of topics which are covered by the text. And in fact, again, he will do the job by analyzing the probability of occurrences for each word in the text 
uh, tagged with a particular topics label, and it will uh, understand that if, for example, in a text, you are talking more about core measurement, is because you are related to petrophysical measurement uh, kind of document, and etc. etc. So the probabilistic representation of the text will give the computer an ID of the topics. And again, to proceed uh, and to be successful, we need to uh, use generic language model, but which have been fine-tuned using uh, manual label data for this particular uh, uh, task. And what is good is that the fine-tuned classification model, even if it's trained only with 4,000 sentences, uh, they are outperforming the, the classification you should uh, get if you were using the big language model, but generic language model without the fine tuning. So it means that these 4,000 sentences that you manually tag in terms of, for example, of geoscience topic, it's worth the work you are doing because the classification model you will obtain using these, these 4,000 sentences manually tagged with geoscience, this classification model is much, much, much better than if you are using the generic model uh, without fine tuning. For question answering, it's another uh, very uh, important uh, task. You can use a, a very big uh, GeoParty uh, pipeline, which has been done by IBM Watson a couple of years ago. This uh, pipeline was very good because it was using uh, open world uh, knowledge. It means that when GeoParty answer question from uh, 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 for a candidate, uh, he has access to a huge amount of information, and he was uh, using a very complex pipeline. Today is not what we are doing. Today we are using what we call extractive context-based factoric supervised. It means that the answer we will find to a question will be extracted from a corpus of text, and from this corpus of text, depending the question you ask to the computer, the computer will be able to find among the text, the fraction of the text, which could be a good answer to your questions. Again, language models are used with huge benefits for this question and answering task, but they need to be trained with supervised modding. So you need to provide to the computer a big uh, list of questions and associated answers covering geoscience. Um, for example, it's something that uh, uh, Stanford University have, 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 have started a couple of years ago. Uh, they provide uh, what we call the squad data set. It corresponds to hundreds and thousands of questions and associated answers uh, related to uh, text, uh, chunk of text like this one. Uh, and they have done that for uh, different uh, topics, but there is a big need to be done for uh, geoscience. So again, BERT model cannot work efficiently if geoscientists uh, like us and like you don't make this kind of uh, question answer data sets uh, for a fine tuning uh, uh, technique. Um, why, in fact, this fine tuning is needed is because when you are using question answering engine, for example, Google search, what Google search is doing when you ask a question, for example, is what the average porosity in Egina, Google search is first trying to analyze the different name entities into the questions. A name entity is a word corresponding to a concept. So, for example, in this case, the concept of porosity is a name entity. So, uh, uh, I will say a fine-tuned Google search will understand that porosity is a petrophysical measurement. And Egina will be identified as a field. So, he has also the concept of field, of reservoir, or petroleum field, or oil and gas field. And it will be automatically understand, understood that the question you are asking is about a petrophysical measurement uh, for a particular oil and gas field. 
and why these name entities are Hello, I don't hear Jerome anymore. I guess uh, Jerome had a problem. I think we have uh, a lot of sound. Yeah, uh, just let's wait. Uh, Jerome, we can hear you. I guess he, he doesn't uh, really just wait a minute. Maybe he had a problem with the connection of his computer. Okay, okay. So not not so long ago. Okay, uh, yes. I you just come back. Ooh, I was thinking I was uh, I was talking for the last uh, twenty minutes. Uh, okay, so I come back. It's not it's not so long. Uh, I don't know why time out. Okay, I I was here. Yes. Okay, so the key not uh, we not redo everything. So the key information is to understand that the entities are very important to rank the context and from this rank filter context the language model can find answer to your questions but to rank the co the context efficiently it's approximate it is needed to have the computer understanding the concept in the questions and the concept in the questions uh, are name entities and the name entities are extracted accordingly to the uh, to the training data you provide to the computer. So if you don't train the computer to recognize geoscience context, it will not be possible for him for it to recognize the name entities. So it will not be possible for it to filter the context in a correct manner. So for summarization, uh, you have extractive approaches which are not supervised. And it just tried to extract the key phrases, the key sentences into the text, but the value is not very good. You have also the supervised approach using language model, which are very interesting, very uh, uh, performant. But again, you absolutely need to fine tune a generic model uh, to recognize abstract uh, for geoscience. So the only way to proceed is to fine tune the summarization model with a lot of articles, for example, where you provide on one side the text, the full text, and on the other side the abstract. And you, if you train a model to do to do this kind of uh, of mapping between the full text and the abstract on thousands and thousands of articles, uh, a BERT model could do a good job by generating abstract from a full text. But again, this need uh, a lot of data uh, to be to be trained uh, correctly. So. Uh, just to before to uh, to go to the final part of the speech, do you have any questions about about uh, this uh, overview of the techniques what we can use to extract knowledge from uh, from articles or from but from documents? There is one question about the bias. So how geologists find oil and gas uh, new concepts? And how the corpus is built on old ones? About the the bias, you mean? The bias, yeah. Ah, alors, very good question. Um, the first thing is, 
a computer and an AI model knows or has a representation only of what the what is inside the training corpus he used during the, the training process. So if we consider, and I say if we consider that a computer can understand, I will say, or mimic the understanding of concepts, these concepts are percolating only from the probabilistic representation that the computer has built from the corpus of text used for the training. So if uh, oil and gas, new uh, uh, occurrences are coming from a, con a concept which has not been explained or uh, analyzed in the text used by the computer for training, he will not find it. This kind of tools is not dedicated uh, to propose concepts or to propose new things. It's just here to analyze the content and to serve the knowledge which is stored in the document uh, that is parsing. Um, we will see, and it will be the last section of the speech, we will see that a tool like a knowledge graph maybe uh, could maybe uh, propose new concepts or new analogies. But it's true, uh, as Jean-Jacques just mentioned, that some, sometimes uh, we know that also uh, in oil and gas, uh, honestly, except uh, maybe in the non-conventional, but not even. Usually the concept for finding oil and gas are more or less well known today. Uh, the oil and gas industry is, uh, I will say, is a, is a kind of all lady in terms of concepts. But maybe, for example, for the new uh, energy, like uh, hydrogen, like geothermal, like uh, even uh, new, uh, new activity like uh, carbon storage in sequestration, is maybe where AI and knowledge graph could be, in the, lead, could be the lead to, to develop new, new concepts and new analogies. So, just to finish, because I know it's quite late, and maybe uh, for me it's okay, but maybe for you it's, it's the end of the of the of the day, and I don't want to be too too bad with you. Um, knowledge graph. What we discussed for the moment, it was all based on text. We have seen together how to extract information from text, but. You know that in a report, there is a lot of information beyond text only. There is a lot of information in tables, in figures. So how to extract this information directly from a PDF report, but how to extract the information beyond text only? And this could be done because we have the concept of layout. And as a pupil said to his, uh, to his friend, um, usually, if you serve to the customer and to the user pictures associated to a, a paragraph of text where some information has been found, the pictures by itself, by, by themselves, could provide a very valuable information. Uh, I need, uh, for the presentation, I need to blur the page just because it was a, enfin, it was a geo, real geoscience uh, document and, I, I had to blur that. But you can recognize on this document page that you have paragraph of text and you have a big uh, central map figures with information on it. It's what we call extracting the metadata knowledge. So the data coming from everything, from the text content, from the image and table content, and also from the layout, the way that uh, the page is organized. And is also to answer the question I had about how to reconstruct text from a complex exotic layout. To do that, in fact, automatically, we train a model to recognize the different element in this layout. So it could be paragraph of text, it could be title, it could be images, it could be, it could be a table. And to analyze these bonding and to 
automatically draw bonding boxes around these different elements of the layout and to construct a graph, a knowledge graph, where all these different layout elements are linked together. And if I do that for a single document on the right, this is some work I have done with a, a GeoScience corpus, a single document on the right could be represented as node, green node corresponding to the pages of the document. And each pink node correspond to a paragraph of text linked to these pages, or each uh, orange nodes correspond to a table uh, related to a pages. And you understand that when you have this representation as a graph, you can navigate into a document by analogies or by, I would say, shortest path uh, search, which is more efficient when if you work uh, directly uh, by uh, uh, looking at the page of the document by yourself. And what we can do for a single document, we can also do it for a corpus on the left. And you see on the corpus on the left, you summarized in a graph the content of thousands or hundreds of thousands of documents. And when you have this graph representation, you can do search very quickly. So for example, here, I say I do a search by using the neighborhood search. I found an information to my questions in this paragraph of text. But I say, OK, maybe some information is also hosted in the figure around or at the proximity at, in the neighborhood of this paragraph. And automatically, because I am using a graph representation, the concept of neighborhood is very, is very quick uh, to retrieve, much quicker than if I was using another way of representing document. I just do the filtering of the figure, and I sh just compute automatically the shortest path between the page node in purple and the figure which are related to this purple node. And because I am in a graph, and because I can filter on the class of the nodes, and because I have very powerful algorithm to compute shortest path between nodes, I can retrieve the information very quickly. I can also do what we call nested filtering, and it's a little bit more complex, is where you have a graph, which is called a multi-parted graph, where in fact the nodes have different natures. For example, I can have a graph where I have nodes corresponding to topics, for example, marketing and service, financial topics. And this time, the other kind of nodes corresponding to the bonding box information for the page, for the paragraph, for the text, for the figure, are related, are, are linked to these specific topics. And to do when you're using this kind of multi-parted graph, I can retrieve the information, for example, related to a topics a very efficient way. Alors, this work, I, I started this work with Total Energies uh, last year. And the main difficulties, in fact, when you have this big, big, big graph, is as the performance. To analyze and to search in information in this kind of graph, it's very, very quickly you have a problem of scalability. And I was pretty happy because last month or two months ago, no, in June, uh, in fact, I have seen that Google is uh, doing the same kind of uh, research that uh, I am doing and the, the layout, the research on layout is something which is uh, very, very exotic, but very promising for the last couple of years. And for, for analyzing the layout graph of documents, they are using what we call a self-attention matrix. And it's a very small word, in fact, because the self-attention matrix is also the concept which is the foundation of the language model we are, we are using to analyze the, the text uh, with BERT, for example. So you see the loop, it's a looping technology, in fact. All the concept we were using to uh, create language model is based on the, what we call the self-attention concept. And this self-attention concept has been reused by Google because they are the, they are the creator of the self-attention concept. They have reused the self assertion concept to analyze automatically the layout of a document. So 
there is a big, uh, big work to be done still on analyzing the layout, especially to extract all the knowledge and not only the text knowledge, but all the knowledge to populate uh, a knowledge graph. And the knowledge graph is the only way to propose, uh, a, I will say, a complete answers to questions. And also by using a knowledge graph, here it's where you can have analogies or new concept coming from the knowledge graph, which will not came from, a, a, I will say, a traditional search engine. Because in a knowledge graph, because you are working in interconnected nodes, the concept of neighborhood is much rich. You can define and you can create analogies by using this knowledge information as a graph. You can find analogies that you will not found if you were if you were using a, a very uh, much linear traditional uh, way to organize the knowledge. So just a conclusion, and I hope I'm still uh, connected. I think so. Uh, foundation models that uh, have been proposed by Google, Facebook, OpenAI, they are good, but they are not sufficient for direct use in industrial domains such as geoscience. To be, to be valuable, you as a geoscientist need to work with data scientists to fine tune this generic model. And to fine tune this generic model, you need, we all need access to valuable data share between all of us and with data scientists and maybe uh, uh, we say tech company. And these share valuable data correspond to annotated corpus, annotated corpora of documents, where in fact you as a subject matter expert, you have injected into this tech document your geoscience knowledge. To do that, you can use heuristic or glossaries and dictionaries as an efficient way to pre-label, to label, to do the first draft labeling automatically. And after that, as a subject matter expert, your job is to correct, to fix the mistakes or to enrich what has been done automatically by using this heuristic or glossaric solution. And the final important uh, takeaway is that in a document, the knowledge is not only the text. The knowledge is, of course, the figure and the table, but the layout and the way that these pieces of knowledge are organized all together, it's also very valuable, especially when you organize this knowledge in a graph and the layout will give you the metadata needed to, do more, to be more efficient during the search. Okay, so I'm sorry I was a little bit long. Uh, and I'm sorry about the, the technical issue. When I stopped, uh, I was not connecting anymore. So let me check. Ah, 12 no people. No, but 12 no people still uh, remaining. So I was, I was expecting maybe six people. So 12 is not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Jerome. It was really nice presentation. But thank you. So if you have any discussion command uh, yes uh, Jean-Jacques has uh, has a question about um, the collaboration within Google and and um, total energies does this collaboration continue um, um, uh, in I fact, mean the work the work uh, yeah, you, you I will, were doing I will, you, I will give you about what I know but of course I'm not talking about for, for total energy on behalf of total energy because I'm no more total energy. As far as I know, the, the job what we have done with Google is in production and he has a very good value um, and is already is in production and people are using it. Uh, as you have seen in the press release, total energies have, have, have made a, a strategic, uh, um, a strategic um, um, agreement with Microsoft um, to, uh, to, 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 to develop uh, his digital transformation uh, platform using Microsoft technologies. Uh, so today, I, I don't know, but I'm not very sure that Total will continue to work with Google about oil and gas business and to continue. The, the product has been released. The product is working fine. So the cycle ended. 
in a, in a success. So I don't, I'm not aware about this specific project to continue with Google, but there is definitely new things coming about NLP uh, and uh, new NLP in geoscience and NLP beyond geoscience, certainly with uh, Microsoft or maybe uh, Amazon because Total Energies are also sign agreement with Amazon. Okay. So the topic is not, the, the topic is still very hot. Uh, but maybe the partner are, are a little bit different. Okay, thank you, John. So you have a few comments there in the in the chat, as you can read it. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, NLP and natural language processing is a little bit. Uh, in, in fact, is is quite. It's quite difficult and challenging to present concisely first in in a in a simple manner because and everything is is about representation. Uh, it's not so easy to understand how a computer can represent in his memory a text and how can he work with with it. And um, the concept of representation is difficult. I see that Ima Denin has uh, raised his hand. So if you have a question. Yes, please, Imadeli. Yes, uh, thank you, Jerome, for your presentation. It, it was good. Uh, my question is about uh, the compatibility and the interoperability of these models. Since you have speak in the beginning about ontologies and uh, mm -hmm. in the tuning, and tuning phase, and uh, just I'm asking, uh, are these ontologies you have you have uh, developed your own ontologies in this work, or uh, you are basing mm -hmm. on uh, existing ones? Since there is a lot yes. of project. Uh, in this moment about uh, ontologies and uh, one geology, like pro loop project, CGI and DDI? Mm -hmm. uh, very good questions. Uh, for, the, for the purpose of the project we had with, with Google, we decided to develop our own ontologies because we, we wanted to develop an ontology which could give us uh, value in terms of uh, information retrieval, but which will not be too complex and too big, uh, not to be uh, overwhelmed, enfin, to be, uh, uh, not to be too complex first for the labeling purpose and also to train an AI model. So the ontology we developed for these particular tools consists on only seven entities, all related to the well, to the well object. You're totally right when you tell that uh, you have many different ontologies existing and several of them are definitely covering oil and gas business. It's very important uh, to use the same ontology. And for example, um, several months ago, I was discussing with people working on the OSDU, OSDU project. Y yes. And apparently OSDU, they have people working on uh, NLP and ontologies. Mm -hmm. It's very critical to be successful at a large scale that we agree all together, service company, integrated oil and gas company, academic people, it's very important to agree about the ontologies we will use. Because as you said, mm -hmm. if we create data, enfin, if we create label data, and if we train models with different ontologies, it will be not possible or not very easy to interconnect these models all together. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to work on the ontologies first, Mm -hmm. And to agree about the ontologies before to to enter the the training uh, process and to work with AI. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. There is still some questions. I guess no. I guess we can finish now the your presentation, <coughs> John. Okay. Okay. And I would say stop sharing. Okay. So, but thank you uh, very much uh, for having uh, me. <laughs> thank, you, uh, thank you, Jerome. Thank you, Jerome. And uh, uh, I hope it was. Uh, I was. Uh, I hope it was not too too boring or too too fast. I don't know. <laughs> it was. It was perfect. Yeah. For for me. <laughs> well, I I know I know the topic, so it was it was really good for me. But okay. um, new terms, as you say, ah. there is new terms, new words for people that uh, are not familiar with